What's up? It's me, Son of Terror 92, coming back at you with another episode of 60 Years of the Space Age. Now, for returning viewers, I know you're sort of expecting some sort of incredible opening shot. Maybe of a rocket taking off, or perhaps an orbital view of the planet. That's usually how we do things around these parts, but I need to make an announcement first. Get something off my chest. But to first-time viewers out there, welcome to 60 Years of the Space Age, an ongoing internet podcast series where we talk about the history of the human presence in outer space from Sputnik to the current day in commemoration of the launch of Sputnik in 1957. We are now in Episode 3, and I have a wonderful program ahead for y'all entitled Sergei Korolev. Into the Fire, or as I imagine what the full title would be, Sergei Korolev, Out of the Frying Pan and Into the Fire. We'll touch more on the reasons of that later. But before we launch our R7 rockets into the great depths of outer space, I want to say something first. If you're new to the program, go ahead and check out our previous episodes. The first one, mainly about our lead character for today, Russian rocket designer Sergei Korolev. And that largely sets up the premise for today's episode. You can go ahead and check that out through the link down below or right here. The second episode where we talk about another important figure in the human journey to outer space, Werner von Braun. To any native Deutsch speakers out there, that episode might be a little cringeworthy. I speak a little German in there and I realize now it should be Buchenwald, not Buchenwald. Y'all can also check that out through the link down below. Now before we get started, I just wanted to spend some time explaining why you're looking at mostly a static image, whereas in previous episodes I'd have more moving pictures mixed in with some video. I'm switching over to a more narrative podcast audio drama style for this series. Since it takes way too long to edit the video for a suitable duration, I'd rather focus on the vocal storytelling aspects of this series, sort of like a Dan Carlin hardcore history approach. I highly recommend you guys check out the, that series podcast. Of course, I don't think I can compare to how Dan Carlin does it, but I do hope I can hold up to some measure. I realize what I enjoy the most from doing this series are the research, the writing, and the narration parts, not so much the video editing parts, and I like to focus on those parts that I enjoy to truly maximize the impact of the stories that I tell here on uh, Morty 60 Years of the Space Age. The editing of the videos to make it look like episode 2, Werner von Braun, Escape from Vengeance, can be a bit much sometimes, and it really is a bottleneck. So for now, 60 Years of the Space Age will follow a vocal narrative podcast style show with some added effects thrown in. And hopefully I'll be able to crank out more of these and with more value per episode as I continue to deliver them. So go ahead, get yourself a drink or turn on a video game or something and you can enjoy this in the background while you do other tasks. That's how I recommend you enjoy this series. I'll edit what I can along the way and scale it up as we go along. I just hope you guys stay tuned and enjoy the program. Now with that out of the way, onwards with the show. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epics, 60 Years of the Space Age. Welcome back to 60 Years of the Space Age a podcast series that aims for the moon and hopes to go beyond as we document the history of the human presence in outer space from Sputnik to the present day. In commemoration of the launch of Sputnik, the first man-made object in space 60 years ago, I want to start this show by taking a moment to talk about life experiences and the type of life experiences that can significantly change a person, like the psychedelic life experiences. But one experience that usually comes to mind is traveling. I know that my generation, the millennials, they're very much into traveling. And this being a podcast about the human journey into outer space is also, in a way, about traveling. Because that's what we're doing, actually. We're traveling out there to other worlds that have never been visited before, like the moon and Mars, in order to understand them better. And hopefully, in the process, to alter our perspectives and understandings of our place in the universe and the cosmos. But like they said in Kingsman, this ain't that kind of movie, bruv. 
traveling can be a life-changing experience, but only if you're open-minded enough to take in the best and the worst aspects of it and growing from it. Which brings us to the two experiences that I do want to talk about, that I do want to elaborate on. Two experiences that can really change any person for the rest of their life. And that is going to war and going to prison. Not that I've ever gone to war, although I do have a friend who has. And not that I've ever gone to prison, although I do have more than one friend who has. They tend to be very different people. These two experiences, war and incarceration, tend to strip a person down to the very core of their character and reshape them as completely new people afterwards, whether they want it to or not. Sometimes you end up reshaped for the better, other times for the worse. But imagine a situation where you end up going to prison, serving your sentence there in the worst possible conditions imaginable. A labor camp at the ends of the earth in Siberia, and then coming out of that prison only to be thrust into the middle of the most violent conflict of human history, World War II. Talk about out of the frying pan and into the fire, which is where we get the title of today's episode, Sergei Korolev, Into the Fire. Escaping a prison sentence and then being sentenced to the battlefield is exactly what happened to Sergei Pavlovich Korolev, the character we introduced in our first episode, the soon-to-be chief designer and architect of the Soviet space program. He played the vital role as leader and coordinator of the Soviet space program that allowed Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin to sail into space. Two names that will continue to exist throughout human history as the defining first steps human beings took in the journey to outer space. As the defining first steps our species took to explore the cosmos. And they couldn't have done it without him. Sputnik and Gagarin. Achievements that have, until today and until the end of days, solidified Russia and the Russian people's contribution towards the human dream of ultimately reaching the stars. But in 1939, at the beginning of the Second World War, Sergei Korolev's life was less a dream of reaching the stars and more a nightmare of locked iron bars. Skr. Korolev had found himself imprisoned in Kolyma Gulag in Siberia, a forced labor work camp, because of some political intrigue that followed the Great Purges, a terrible event, a black stain on the history of mankind, an event when Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, in an attempt to consolidate his power, got rid of people that he believed to be unloyal to him, and basically had them shot stabbed, or worse. Korolev was thrown under the bus, accused of disloyalty by fellow rocket scientist Valentin Glushko, a man whom he would rival and beef with until his deathbed in the 60s, well into the heydays of the space race. That and Korolev was boinking his sister-in-law. Little known fact, Sergei Korolev was quite the ladies' man. He was quite the charmer. He lived an austere and modest lifestyle for the most part, never partaking to excess the traditional Russian drink of vodka. But when it came to women, there was somewhat of an exception. He, he had a soft spot. Anyway, for Sergei Korolev, as someone who had dreamed of using rockets to escape to other worlds, Kolima was pretty much situated at the very end of this one. It was cold, the food sucked, the work in the mines was backbreaking. Korolev lost most of his teeth from scurvy for a man who had spent his early life as a high profile scientist, a prodigy, and the pride of the motherland. Those were very dark days. Any lesser man would have probably succumbed to the harsh conditions at Kolima and thousands of others actually did. But everything changed when the Aryan nation attacked. On June 22, 1941, Adolf Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, the largest land invasion in the history of human warfare. 
An army of four million men marched eastwards from Germany into the Soviet Union, burning and destroying the country as they went. Stalin realized he had made a mistake and that he needed those rocket scientists, engineers and technicians that he had disposed of during the purge to help turn back the tide of the war. In a monumental change of direction, Korolev and several other former Soviet scientists and engineers were taken out of prison and set to work for the motherland, still technically under arrest. Could you imagine the insanity of it all? These people had arrested and tortured you, killed your friends and ruined your life. And now they come asking for your help to save them? If I were Korolev, I'd have half a mind to bugger the whole deal entirely. Then of course I'd most likely be sh then of course I'd most likely be shot. So pick your poison. It really boggles the mind to think that the world used to operate this way scarcely less than 100 years ago. That's why I think the overall psyche of the human race was profoundly affected and changed by those years between the late 1930s and early 1940s. Think of them as growing up pains for an emerging technical civilization. World War II was the divide between the old, more violent, nationalistic, and ideologically driven world of yesteryear, of before, and the more interconnected, egalitarian world that we live in today. But of, of course, there are still many parts of the world that face a lot of injustice, but all of it, it's a work in progress. Humanity is a work in progress, just like the space age. During World War II, Korolev was fortunate enough to be taken under the arm of legendary Soviet aircraft designer Andrei Tupolev, who was also released from prison. The man who would bear an entire line of past and present aircrafts as his namesake. Like for example the TU, TU for Tupolev, TU-95, a massive four-engine turboprop strategic bomber, nicknamed the Bear by NATO in the West. It is the Russian equivalent of the B-52 strategic bomber used by the Americans. The name Tupolev today belongs to an entire aerospace company in its own right. So talk about a legacy, yeah? Korolev's primary contribution during the war was the design of an auxiliary rocket motor used for jet-assisted takeoff of the Lavochkin LA-7 fighter, an exceptional aircraft for its time that managed to perform as well as many German-built fighter planes during the war. So we tend to have this opinion that everything, all the machines made by the Germans were, to quote YouTuber Lindy Beige, just ace, absolutely great. German machines produced by, made in Germany, all good stuff. But during the war, the Soviets also came up with quite a few technological marvels themselves, not just the T-34, was it one of the best tanks of the war, but other pieces of machinery that really surprised and to say overwhelmed the Germans. So, yeah. Now, Sergei Korolev invented this auxiliary rocket motor while working as deputy under, surprise, surprise, Valentin Glushko, the man who had sold him out to be thrown in jail in the first place. Wow, talk about frenemies, huh? You can't work with him, you can't work without him. Throughout the war, their research center was moved several times for fear of being captured by the rampaging German army, so danger was never too far away. But eventually, the Soviet Union began to push back the German invaders. Korolev was paroled and would eventually be promoted as Korolev was pardoned and paroled and would eventually be promoted as a colonel in the Red Army in 1945. His role in mankind's journey to outer space was only just beginning. Korolev was definitely a changed man after his experiences. Through his ordeal in Kolyma and the Second World War, he became a dynamic force of nature that didn't take any sort of nonsense from anybody. This character built from his hardships would be crucial for navigating the complex political bureaucracies and intrigue of the Soviet space program and the Soviet Union after the war, and as we shall see in later episodes, made him a defining driving force behind 
Soviet success in the early space age. Like I said, they couldn't have done it without him. This has been 60 Years of the Space Age, an ongoing internet podcast series where we talk about the history of the human presence in outer space from Sputnik to the current day in commemoration of the launch of Sputnik in 1957. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Peace.